Son, I love you as much today as I did today that you were born. Raising you was the honor of my life, and I'm very proud of you. Your honor, these men have chose to lie and attack my son and his surviving family. They each have no remorse and do not deserve any leniency. A child's birthday party! Douglas County prosecutors say Norton was not one of the writers who pointed shotguns at the adults and children in the yard of the Douglasville home. But David Amati says she was among many who hurled menacing threats while yelling the N-word. Did he ever admit to you any crimes that he committed that no one knows about? 32. 32 cold cases of, of murders that he personally participated in. He, per, he personally performed himself, yes. I says, I'm a black man. I said, you got a few white guys in here who's trying to suck up to you every day. You know, fellow Klansmen. In today's day and age, it's an undisputable fact that everyone, despite their background, race, or ethnicity, deserves to be treated with dignity, respect, and equality. For far too many years, racism has driven a sense of hatred through communities, caused division, and claimed innocent lives. Now, not everyone in this video may have admitted to being a part of the Aryan Brotherhood or other well-known racist organizations, but they did display hateful and discriminatory actions against people who were simply trying to mind their own business. Their victims committed no crime, they just happened to not look a certain way. These are some of the most crazy and sometimes violent reactions of racist people finding out they are going to have to pay for their actions. The horrific killing of Ahmad Arbery is most likely one of the most infamous racist killings in recent years. This story took place on February 23rd of 2020 in Brunswick, Georgia. Ahmad, a 25-year-old African-American man, was taking a run through a local neighborhood when he was targeted by three white men. These men were then 64-year-old Gregory McMichael, his son, then 34-year-old Travis McMichael, and their neighbor, William Roderick Bryan Jr who went by Roddy. The three white men suspected that Ahmad might have been involved in a recent burglary. Even though they had no proof, they began to chase after him. What happened next was captured on video and later went viral. The cell phone video captures the final moments of Ahmad Arbery's life while he was jogging through this Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood in February. Arbery was confronted by Gregory McMichael and his son Travis, <laughs> who shot Arbery twice with a shotgun before the 25-year-old collapsed and died. Travis McMichael had called the police just days before Ahmad's death. He reported seeing a black man hanging out around a house in his neighborhood that was under construction. This 911 call would later be played in court. What do they look like? Uh, it's a black male, red shirt, white shorts. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah, when I, it just startled me. Um, when I turned around, when I turned around and saw him and backed up, he reached into his pocket and ran into the house. So I don't know if he's armed or not. While there had been an increase in crime in the area in recent months, Ahmad was no burglar. He was simply a man who was trying to get some exercise. After the shooting, local law enforcement arrived quickly. They knew Gregory McMichael well because he had once worked for the service. The three perpetrators claimed that they had acted only in self-defense. Their version of events was that Travis spotted Ahmad first and believed him to be the burglary suspect he was earlier. He then ordered him to stop before the two of them began physically fighting. It appeared that Ahmad was trying to wrestle the weapon out of Travis's hands before he was killed. For months, there were no arrests made. It wasn't until pressure began to mount against law enforcement upon the release of the cell phone footage that things finally began to happen with this case. The video led to mass outrage, as well as continued national conversation about racism and the need for change across the nation. Many people, including celebrities, spoke up on this issue. Ahmad's mother, Wanda Jones, also came forward to discuss the video. My son was not committing a crime. He was out for his daily jog and he was hunted down like an animal and killed. 
Both Greg and Travis McMichael were arrested in early May and charged with murder. William Bryan was arrested later that month. All three men pleaded not guilty. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic and courts being shut down, it would take a long time to get the trial going. When it finally began, it was clear from the start that this was going to be a very tense and controversial case. It would highlight not only the racist aspects involved in the death of Ahmad, but also the mistakes that law enforcement may have made immediately afterward by waiting so long to arrest the suspects. Watch as the prosecutor questions one of the officers involved at the scene. Did Mr. Bryan ever say that Ahmad had a weapon no. on him that day? No, ma'am. Okay. Did Mr. Bryan ever say Ahmad made any verbal threats towards him or any other person that day? No. Due to how long it took for justice to be served, Ahmad's mother told the press that she wasn't sure she was ever going to see her son's killers face trial. But as she stood outside of the courtroom after they were taken into custody, she seemed hopeful. This day, as we stand before this courthouse, I thought this day would never come. Oh, yeah. We know how boy would and we kept searching for answers. But guess what? It's God. We didn't give up. While in court, the defense played the 911 call from Gregory McMichael. This call was from the day of Ahmad's death, and you can hear fighting going on in the background. 911, what's the address of emergency? Uh, I'm not here. Tell us yours. It's a black male. Running down the street. Satilla, where, where, where at Satilla Shores? I don't know what street we're on. It, stop, what's that? It, it, stop. Sir, hello, sir. Sir, where are you at? The dispatcher continues to try to make contact with the caller, but the call is abruptly ended. You might be wondering, what was the purpose that the defense had in mind for playing this clip in court? It was likely done in an effort to make the suspects look like they were just trying to be responsible. Well, this is a very tricky issue, and it really goes to the heart of the case. The tapes make the McMichaels sound like they're responsible citizens reporting crimes. Travis McMichael even apparently comes face to face with Aubrey a couple of weeks before the fatal encounter. So were these suspects well-meaning citizens who just overreacted? Or were they racist, cold-blooded killers? After a dramatic trial, it would be up for the jury to decide. People all around the world tuned in anxiously in November of 2021, as it was announced that a verdict had been reached. Everyone was anxiously waiting to hear the conclusion the jury had come up with. Travis was the first to be found guilty. He remained stone-faced and emotionless as the verdict was read. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm going to ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. As this court has indicated, I ask that there be no outbursts in the court, and I expect as much from the gallery. The judge said that if there was anyone else in the courtroom that felt they would not be able to contain their emotions, they should take the opportunity to leave. It didn't appear that anyone else decided to go anywhere. After Travis was found guilty of all charges, his father, Greg, was up next. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Greg simply closed his eyes and hung his head as the guilty verdict was read. Last up was William Bryan, AKA Roddy. Roddy looked extremely distressed as the verdict was announced. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, guilty. In total, Roddy was found guilty of felony murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and criminal attempt to commit a felony. These were lesser offenses than what the other two men were convicted of. Because of the extent of their charges, it was guaranteed that both Travis and Greg McMichael would automatically be sentenced to life behind bars. However, there was still a formal sentencing that took place in January of 2022. Before sentencing, Ahmad's mother had the chance to provide a victim impact statement. Wanda Cooper wore a button with her son's face on it as she tearfully approached the stand. The heartbreak and devastation that she was experiencing was evident. Oh, I want to first speak directly to my son. If I please. This verdict 
doesn't bring you back. But it does help bring closure to this very difficult chapter of my life. Wanda told the court that on that day that she buried her 25-year-old son, she made a promise to both him and herself. She promised that she would get justice for him. And that was a promise that she was thankful to have been able to keep. Son, I love you as much today as I did today that you were born. Raising you was the honor of my life and I'm very proud of you. Your Honor, these men have chose to lie and attack my son and his surviving family. They each have no remorse and do not deserve any leniency. She went on to say that this was not a mere accident or a case of mistaken identity. Rather, these men chose to act in this way because they didn't view Ahmad as being worthy of dignity or respect. They didn't want him in their community simply because of the color of his skin. She concluded her statement by asking the judge to give her son's killers the maximum sentence. We start with this statement. As we all now know, based upon the verdict that was rendered in this court in November, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy on many, many levels. He then went on to discuss how the only thing that Ahmad had wanted to do was go for a jog, and that would ultimately lead to his premature death. A resident of Glynn County, a graduate of Brunswick High, a son, a brother, a young man with dreams was gunned down in this community. As we understand it, he left his home apparently to go for a run, and he ended up running for his life. Ultimately, both Travis and Greg McMichael were sentenced to life in prison with no parole, plus 20 years. Roddy was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Do you agree with the sentencing? Let us know in the comments. Judge sentenced Russell Courtier to life in prison. He killed 19-year-old Larnell Bruce in Gresham back in 2016. This next case is particularly horrific and just goes to show what some people are capable of when they are filled with this strong of hate and anger. 19-year-old Larnell Bruce was a young black man who had been minding his own business outside of a 7-Eleven in Oregon on August 10th of 2016 when the unthinkable happened. A white man named Russell Courtier, who was driving a Jeep, spotted Larnell and promptly ran him with the vehicle. The teen passed away from his injuries a few days later. Russell was a known white supremacist and a member of the European Kindred, a street gang. He killed Larnell simply because he was African American. It was a shocking crime that disturbed the community. Russell, as well as his girlfriend, Colleen Hunt, who had also been in the vehicle, were later arrested. He was charged with murder and a hate crime, and she pleaded guilty to manslaughter. They were found guilty of the charges in March of 2019. While Colleen was sentenced to 10 years behind bars, Russell was sentenced to life. The victim's family says they feel a sense of relief. Their focus now is spreading love. 40-year-old Russell Courtier teared up during today's hearing, but the victim's family believes it was all for show. The judge says he was driven by hate and anger when he ran over and killed Larnell Bruce in August of 2016. Larnell's life was stolen from him far too soon, but even in death, he was able to be a hero by helping other people through organ donation. The victim's family met with us after the hearing surrounded by green balloons to promote organ donation. They say Bruce's organs helped save five people. As for the man now sentenced to life in prison, they say they hope he realizes how much they all have lost. Following the hearing, Larnell's father, Larnell Bruce Sr., addressed the court as he explained how he got to the conclusion that he would not benefit from holding on to hate and anger, just as Russell had done. It, was, it wasn't until um, I took the time to realize what he lost too, that it made sense to me that it, it wouldn't do me no good to, to approach it 
angrily, because that's what got us here to begin with. Two people died. A third was hurt, but survived. There was help that was needed, and I tried to help. Headlines about white supremacy and mass violence shoved a grieving city into a global spotlight. Jeremy Christian is a very angry and very racist man. In 2017, Jeremy was riding on a train in Portland, Oregon, when he came across two black teenage girls. Their names were Destiny Magnum and Walia Muhammad. Even though the girls were just minding their own business, Jeremy decided to target them in a racist and anti-Muslim rant. Three men, Ricky John Best, Tailson Maidran Nagmaki Mech, and Micah David Cole Fletcher stepped in to try to defend the girls and defuse the situation. Tailson reportedly told Jeremy in a firm voice that he needed to get off the train because he was causing a disruption and making everyone uncomfortable. When Jeremy refused, Micah came forward and gave him a firm push to try and get him off the train. At that point, Jeremy became enraged and told him that if he ever touched him again, he was going to kill him. Micah shoved him once more, and that's when Jeremy proceeded to completely fly off the handle. He attacked Tallison and Micah, as well as Ricky, who had been standing nearby. In the flurry of activity and panic, Jeremy was able to get off the train and escape into the crowd. Luckily, he was arrested soon after and brought into custody. Sadly, both Ricky and Taliesin passed away. Micah was able to survive his wounds. The men who had bravely stepped forward to defend the girls, all while putting their own lives at risk, were hailed as heroes. It didn't take long for Jeremy to show everyone just how unhinged he really was. I'm a real Listen to the bizarre first statement that Jeremy made walking into court. At the time, he was facing murder, attempted murder, and for committing a hate crime. Death to the enemies of America. Leave this country if you hate our freedom. Tonight, the men accused of the horrific rampage on a Portland train, 35-year-old Jeremy Christian, made a belligerent first appearance in court. In February of 2020, after a trial with frequent outbursts, Jeremy was found guilty on all counts. Three, to be the jury duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled cause. To find our verdict upon the count submitted to us as follows. On count one, uh, the verdict is guilty. That's murder in the first degree. Prior to the sentencing, Jeremy had the opportunity to make a statement on his behalf. Shockingly, he took this chance to insult the family members of his victims. I chose violence. People died. You survived. I understand your feelings of guilt. You should apologize to the families, not for not being there, but for being the main contributor of their death. But nothing could compare to the rage that Jeremy went into while listening to one of his victims make a victim impact statement. I hope you rock. See you there, dude. <laughs> no, hey. Go back what to Tennessee, no. too. You, what do I tell Go you? Go back to Tennessee, too. You can we don't want you here. Oh, All your race, state, and On June 24th of 2020, Jeremy was sentenced to two life sentences with no possibility of parole. What do you think we can do to protect our society from angry, hate-filled people like Jeremy Christian? Let us know in the comments. Can you imagine going out of your way to intentionally ruin a little kid's birthday party? That is something that Joel Torres and Kayla Norton of Georgia know something about. The sickening crime in this case took place back in July of 2015. At the time, there was a lot of pain and suffering among the black community due to a tragedy that occurred only one month prior. A racist shooter entered a historically black church in South Carolina to carry out a rage-filled Tragically, nine people were killed while they were simply trying to attend a church service. Joel, who was 26 years old at the time, and Kayla, who was 25 at the time, decided to further add to the pain the community was reeling from by purposefully taunting and terrorizing a family trying to celebrate an eight-year-old girl's birthday. 
Knowing full well what the flag represents, the couple attached multiple different Confederate flags to the back of their pickup truck. They, along with some friends, then drove by the party, waving their weapons in the air and screaming racist threats. To make matters all the more shocking, Joel and Kayla are parents themselves, with three children between them. This is a child's birthday party. Douglas County prosecutors say Norton was not one of the riders who pointed shotguns at the adults and children in the yard of the Douglasville home. But David Amati says she was among many who hurled menacing threats while yelling the N-word. Some people who were at the party decided to get into their own vehicles, arm themselves, and then go after Kayla and Joel. They threatened to kill them. Around this time, it was believed that Kayla grabbed Joel's weapon and loaded it for him before handing it to him. With tensions mounting and multiple weapons involved, this incident could have quickly went from bad to worse and ended in bloodshed. The racist rampage angered people all across the country, as many wanted to see this couple pay for their hateful actions. The court proceedings were incredibly tense with a lot of anger coming from both sides. It was an emotionally charged hearing. In all my years of covering courts, this was probably one of the most intense hearings, court proceedings I've ever had to witness with two mothers, one of the defendants on one side and one of the victims on the other side. While in court, Kayla was visibly emotional as she faced her victims. She claimed that her actions did not reflect the kind of person she really was. That is not me. That is not me. That is not him. I would never walk up to you and say those words to you. But at least one of her victims did not seem to believe her remorse. You stayed. And you stayed affected my life. And it affected my children's lives. Prior to sentencing, Kayla tearfully addressed the judge. I do accept the for what I've done. I know I was in the wrong. The judge was not about to let Kayla and Joel get away with their sickening racist behavior. He shockingly made the decision to give them an even harsher sentence than anyone had been anticipating. This couple would soon learn that they are not going to be getting out of jail anytime soon. Torres and Kayla Norton, in tears most of the hearing, were each given a year longer in prison than the state even was seeking. 13 years for Torres, six for Norton. The judge called their actions a hate crime and racially motivated. Listen to what the judge had to say about the background of the Confederate flag. I suppose a Confederate flag can be interpreted in different ways, in different contexts. But if you drive around town waving Confederate flags and using the N word everywhere you go, then there's only one way to interpret that. Despite Kayla and Joel's hateful actions, one of their victims expressed forgiveness. I forgive you. I forgive all of you. I'm not a man Edgar Ray Killen was a ruthless and well-known member of the KKK. He was born in Mississippi in 1925. As the oldest of eight children, he came from humble beginnings. His father also happened to be a recruiter and organizer for the KKK. So safe to say, Edgar was introduced to the darkest forms of racism at a young age. Throughout the years, Edgar was purposefully responsible for the murders of three men. Each one of them were well-known civil rights activists in the community who had been participating in the Summer of Freedom in 1964. There was an initiative in Mississippi that was intended to get as many African American voters registered as possible. At the time, African Americans were not yet able to vote. Edgar's murders were brutal and extremely disturbing. The victims' names were James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. James was an African American man, and Andrew and Michael were both Jewish. They had traveled to the area to speak at a local church that had been burned, but they got pulled over along the way for speeding and were arrested. As they attempted to leave town, they were pulled over yet again. They were then abducted, killed, and placed in a grave. This started out as a missing persons case, and sadly, Edgar wouldn't actually end up getting indicted for the murders until many years later in 2005. This was only after a local group of citizens formed a coalition to try to push for answers. The case was reopened and a grand jury was convened. At last, Edgar was arrested. Edgar was 80 years old by the time his trial came, and he attended court while in a wheelchair. 
In June of 2005, Edgar was found guilty of three counts of manslaughter, but not murder. At that point, 41 years had passed since the crime was committed. He was sentenced to 60 years behind bars, which meant he would likely die in prison. Edgar died at the age of 92 years old in January of 2018, but before his death, he reportedly confessed. New tonight, a racist killer's jailhouse confession. His words could bring down other members of the KKK. We talked to a former inmate who has documents from Edgar Ray Killen. In them, Killen implicates others in the infamous 1964 killing of three civil rights workers. From footage taken of Edgar Killen outside of the courthouse, it appears he remained angry and hateful until the very end. Do you have any comments? It's hard to believe that a convicted member of the KKK would tell his story to a black man. But after a year in the state prison system, locked up in the same medical ward as Edgar Ray Killen, James Stern claims he became Killen's confidant. Can you imagine not only being locked up with someone who hates you for the color of your skin, but having to hear him tell you about how he used to operate in the KKK? What a strange and unexpected position that James must have found himself in. But wait until you hear just how much Edgar revealed to him. Did he ever admit to you any crimes that he committed that no one knows about? 32. 32 cold cases of, of murders that he personally participated in. He, per, he personally performed himself, yes. I says, I'm a black man. I said, you got a few white guys in here who's trying to suck up to you every day, you know, fellow Klansmen. When James pointed this out to Edgar, Edgar's response was probably even more shocking. He told him that he had respected him more than he respected those in prison who had once worked for the Klan. He told him that he respected James due to his intelligence, something that others in prison did not have. This didn't mean that Edgar still wasn't the racist he always had been, something he proved by the derogatory names he would still sometimes call James. But James chose not to react, and that was why he believes Edgar was comfortable enough to continue to open up to him. James told Edgar that he knew that if he were to come forward and tell people about these confessions, nobody would believe him. The only way they would believe him would be if Edgar wrote his confessions down, and so that is what he agreed to do. While many can likely acknowledge that it's a shame that Edgar didn't have to spend more time behind bars, at least his confession helped bring down many other people who participated in the horrific acts of the KKK and bring closure to the family members of victims. This has been five different stories that proved firsthand that holding on to hate and anger is going to get you nowhere good. These people clung onto racism until they allowed it to ruin their lives and put them behind bars. But these stories also send a clear message. Don't expect to try to lash out in hate as these people did and get away with it. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more.